Welcome back everyone to another episode of The Road Chose Me. My name's Dan and on today's episode, a very special prep and gear episode. So Katie and I are gearing up to drive across the Simpson Desert. This is one of the biggest deserts in Australia. This will be by far my biggest desert crossing of my life. And there is a lot of planning and preparation that goes into it. And obviously fuel and water are big considerations as is food. But of course there's safety equipment, there's first aid, there's spares, there's repairs. There's all of these factors that have to be considered when you're trying to undertake a big crossing like the Simpson Desert. So if you've ever thought about crossing the Simpson or any desert in the world really, and you wonder what goes into it, stick around. I'm gonna get into all the details right now. Before I get into this one, I have two disclaimers that I need to mention on this video. The first one is, Everything I'm about to say, this is my advice and from what I've learned over the years and what I'll be doing to cross the Simpson. That's not to say you should just copy me blindly. You need to learn how your own vehicle performs in the sand. You need to figure out your own fuel consumption, how much water you use when you're out on a trip. All of that, you need to apply your own experience. Please don't just blindly copy what I'm doing. And the second one is that this whole video is going to be in metric. So I'll put all of the US units on the screen. Whenever you see gallons, that's US gallons, distances in miles. But if you're Canadian, you pretty much can just substitute for my metric Australian. If you're in America, those subtitles on the screen will help. And if you're in the UK, sorry guys, I can't help you. So a bit of background, the Simpson Desert is this enormous sand dune filled region that kind of is in Northern South Australia and Southern Northern Territory. And it stretches all the way basically from Alice Springs all the way across to Birdsville. And most people when they drive it, you go from Mount Dare, which is over in the West. It's a small hotel slash pub, has gas station, it has diesel. And you drive over to Birdsville, which is over in the East. And from Birdsville, then you're just on sort of regular gravel roads to get back to civilization. And the reason people do that is because there is fuel at both places. And so that is the minimum distance between fuel stations. Obviously, if you have an enormous amount of range, you could just go from Alice Springs across and skip Mount Dare entirely. But most people wind up going to Mount Dare because it's really cool as well as you need to fuel up again. And you can drive different routes across the Simpson. So the most common route, most people stay in the southern part and there's two separate tracks that they wind up driving, usually the French line and then the QIA line. And they have these funny names for historical reasons, but you can just imagine a horizontal line going straight across the desert that basically stretches from Mount Dare all the way across to Birdsville. And when you do this French line QIA line combination, you have to drive about 550 kilometers and you can drive it in either direction. There are no regulations about that at all. By far, that is the most common route. By far, it is the busiest route. I've been talking to a lot of people this year. They said they're passing about 30 vehicles a day going in the opposite direction to them. That's how much oncoming traffic you're gonna be dealing with and probably similar number going in the same direction as you. So if you're dreaming of getting out in the wide open, being by yourself in the desert, the French line and the QAA line, that's not really where you're gonna get it done. And so that's why that's not what I'm planning to cross. For me, I wanna be remote. I wanna be out away from everybody else. I like people, but I also like my solitude when I'm out in the desert. So for me, all along, I've been planning to cross what's called the Madigan line. And this is super famous, an explorer called Cecil Madigan in 1939. He took a group of men and camels across the desert, first person to ever cross it like that, and kind of the final or the last big piece of exploration in Australia. So a really famous line that you will be following, and it goes actually up into the Northern Territory for most of the trip. It's much more rugged, it's much more remote, and it's also further. So then distance from, Mount Dare to Birdsville is 733 kilometers. So that means logistically, the Madigan line is just that much harder. You're gonna have to carry more fuel, you have to carry more water, you have to carry more food and all of those kinds of supplies. 
The other big hitch too, you're only allowed to drive it in one direction. You must go from Mount Dare across to Birdsville. You must go from west to east. You are not allowed to drive in the opposite direction, which has the added benefit of there will be no oncoming traffic. So as you're cresting the dunes, you don't really have to worry about the potential of that head-on collision. So for me, the Madigan line, way more remote, a little more challenging in terms of logistics, that's the one I'm setting out for, and that's what all of my planning is geared towards. In terms of time of year, they do close the Simpson now in summer. So from the 1st of December until I think the 15th of March, the whole region is closed, you cannot drive it, which you wouldn't want to anyway because it's insanely hot. And so most people wind up driving it in June and July when it's coldest. Of course, there's plenty of people in May, plenty of people in August. But if you stretch it outside that, it's probably going to be hotter and hotter. June and July, you can expect daytime temperatures maybe around 25 Celsius, and it will drop down right around to freezing at night. So expect cold temperatures at night. In terms of logistics, the big one that everyone wants me to talk about is fuel and how much do you need to bring. Now this obviously depends massively on the vehicle that you're driving and what kind of fuel consumption it gets. And everything I've read online, people say, whatever you normally get on the highway, you should add at least 50% to that for the kind of fuel consumption you're gonna get when you're crossing hundreds and hundreds, in fact, more than a thousand big sand dunes. So my Jeep here is petrol, which also changes the equation quite a bit. Most people in Australia are driving diesel vehicles. Diesels usually do better in deep sand. They wind up with lower consumption. As a really rough rule of thumb, what most people say when you're driving a diesel ute or a Land Cruiser or any kind of diesel in Australia, they're getting around 20 litres per 100 kilometres and you need to do 550 kilometers for the French and QAA line. So that means you need about 100 liters. Then everybody usually says, why not make it 120 or 130? That's your safety margin. That, from what I've read, is what most people wind up carrying, and that works really well for a diesel vehicle. Obviously, the Madigan line is a further distance at 733 kilometers, and I think most people wind up bringing about 160, 190 liters of diesel to do the Madigan line. As I said though, my Jeep is petrol, so all bets are off because petrol engines, they can really drink the fuel once you start pushing them hard in the deep sand. So what I've done is I've been out practicing. I drove Goog's track and really noted the consumption and how it went. I've done some beach runs in row, big and little desert. All of that sand driving has given me a good feel for the kind of consumption this vehicle gets. And what I'm banking on based on what it did on Goog's track is it's going to use about 28 litres per 100, obviously more than a diesel. And so then I sort of rounded that up to 30, and then I said, all right, but I want some safety margin in that. Let's make it 35 litres 100. That's how much fuel I'm going to bring. Multiply that out by my 733. I need to bring 250 litres of fuel. Yes, that is a huge amount. That is the downside of a petrol vehicle. So immediately I've got my 83 litre stock tank, I've got my 75 litre OGS tank, so there's 150 right there. I need to bring another 100 litres, hence the jerry cans. So there's three of them on the roof and two of them in the back. And yes, I would have preferred to have more in the back, but fridge, drawers, all my other gear, I just couldn't find a way to mount them in there securely, so I've got three on the roof. And that amount of weight on the roof rack absolutely is not ideal but there are a few things going for me that I think make it acceptable. The first one is the first part of the track, the first 200 kilometers, there aren't any big sand dunes. It's not difficult four wheel driving. So I can go slow and steady on what is essentially a bumpy gravel road. And it doesn't matter too much about the weight on the roof. As soon as I've driven hundred kilometers, I know I will have used up one jerry can worth. I'll pull over on the side and I'll put that jerry can in straight away so I can get the weight off the roof. So I'll do that as I move along to try and get that weight off quickly. The other thing is, it really is only about the same amount of weight as a rooftop tent, which most people seem to have anyway. So that kind of is okay. And then finally, this roof rack from Rhino Rack, it's actually bolted through the hardtop and bolts to the roll cage and to the tub of the Jeep. So that weight, it isn't sitting on the roof. It's actually sitting on the tub and the roll cage, which I think is also a really good thing. So I'll have to be a little bit careful and drive sensibly while the weight's on the roof, but I think it'll be okay. 
And then that's how I came to the conclusion, I'll be carrying 250 liters of petrol to drive the Madigan line. The next major puzzle piece to think about is drinking water and water in general. Obviously we're in the desert, we're not gonna find any water out here. And so the real recommended advice here in Australia, they say you should carry 10 liters per person per day. So also I need to talk about the length of the trip. Obviously now you have to think about how many days is it gonna take you to do the crossing. And I've read of people doing the Madigan line in two or three days, and obviously you could take up to 10 if you wanted to. I don't know exactly how long the crossing is going to take, but given that it's 700 kilometers, aiming to do 100 a day sounds perfectly realistic. So saying that it'll take seven days seems like a really good estimate to me. And what I'll do, my safety margin, I'll say it'll be between seven and 10. So I'll make sure I have enough food and water if it stretches out to 10 days, but really I think I'll be done in about seven. So 10 liters per person per day, that would be 140 liters of drinking water for the two of us for seven days. In fact, 200 liters for the two of us for 10 days. But this is where my experience comes in a bit. And this is where I differ from sort of the bulk advice. I've never used that much water ever. I crossed some of the big deserts in Africa in the summer when it was 45 degrees Celsius every day. And even then I was only using five liters of water a day. My big savings are that I don't wash dishes in a huge bucket. I usually just wet a sponge and wipe off a few things. So I probably use 50 milliliters to do the dishes. I also have a separate bag for my shower, a 10 liter bag that doesn't really detract from my drinking water. And I'm just really careful with how I use water. So for me, I sort of deviated from that advice. What we're gonna bring, we've got our 55 liter main tank of drinking water in the back that's pumped and filtered and all of that. And I actually think that'll last us for the seven days, but just in case it doesn't, we're also bringing two 10 liter bladders and I've packed them in the back. They're in the passenger footwell, which means the weight is as low as it can possibly be. And it's quite well centered between the two axles. So I'm happy about that. And that's our reserve water. And I'll never put that in the main tank. So even if there's a problem with the main tank, if it springs a leak, if the pump doesn't work, we actually have access to that 20 liters of spring water, no problem at all. I like that as a backup option. As well as that, we've got our 10 liter shower bag, which we'll use for washing our hands and having showers. We also have four liters of just random drinking water bottles that we always have in the front. We'll make sure all of these things are totally full to capacity before we set out. And I personally think that'll be enough drinking water. In terms of safety equipment, it's really important that we're self-sufficient because there's a really good chance we're not gonna see anyone for the entire seven to 10 days. Because we're on the Madigan, there isn't gonna be any oncoming traffic. And from my understanding, maybe only a few vehicles a week make the drive. So if we're driving along at a constant speed, the vehicles that are maybe a day or two in front of us and the ones that are a day or two behind us, we're all moving at the same speed, we'll never actually see each other. So it's really important we're self-sufficient. And the first thing there is a really solid first aid kit. And so we have this huge one that's always in the Jeep from Adventure Medical Kits. This thing is really comprehensive. Not only do we have the kit, we also have the training to use it. So I used to be a ski patroller. Katie's done more than 100 hours of first aid training for all of her workplace stuff. So both of, it, both of us have a lot of first aid training and we have the gear inside here. And we even have another first aid kit as well, sort of a smaller one. So first aid kit, really important. And the other big piece of equipment along these same lines is a fire extinguisher. I have one permanently mounted in the back and we have a plan if something goes wrong, my job is to grab that fire extinguisher and do whatever I can. Katie's plan is to get a few essentials out of the Jeep, like the first aid kit, like the drinking water and bail out so that even if we lose the Jeep, we still haven't lost everything and we won't lose our lives. A couple more safety items we have with us we have the sand flag mounted to the roof. This is obviously a legal requirement. You must have one to cross the Simpson. And we also have a GPS communication device. It's not a sat phone, we can't make calls, but we can send messages to our friends and family to say that we're safe, or we can hit the big emergency button and call in a helicopter. So we do have that as our backup comms plan. As well as that, we have a CB radio, again, required by law. So. If a vehicle was within, let's say 30 or 50 kilometers of us, we might be able to chat to them. And obviously if there was some sort of rescue flight, we'd be able to talk to them on any kind of aircraft. 
With our GPS device as well, we've got that in what we're calling our go bag. So if something does go drastically wrong, we wanna make sure that comes with us out of the vehicle and doesn't just stay in the vehicle as it burns to the ground or whatever. So as well as grabbing the drinking water and the first aid kit, Katie's also gonna grab the GPS device. And again, we bail out so that we can actually survive with an emergency blanket, with some fire starter, with some snacks until help can come along. In terms of permits, there are quite a few that you need depending on which route that you're driving. To do the French and the QAA line in the south, you must have a South Australian Desert Parks Pass. That was about $270, and you can pick it up in Mount Dare or Birdsville if you need to. Doing the Madigan line, you need quite a few other permits as well as that one. You have to get approval from the Central Lands Council. These are the Aboriginal people who now own the land in the northern section of the Simpson. That doesn't cost any money, but you have to apply about a week ahead of time and you know they'll approve your itinerary. You also have to get permission from a couple of the different station owners who own the land on either side of the trip and just ask, can I please cross through your private lands? So there is quite a bit of organization and permitting and you must get them before you set out. One piece of kit that I think it's really important to mention is tires for crossing the desert. And there's no doubt about it, the traditional wisdom and kind of old Australian knowledge says you should definitely carry two spare tires. And I get it, that makes a lot of sense. Again, this is where my experience differs a little bit and I'm not actually gonna carry two spare tires. There's quite a few reasons for that. The main one is it's just logistically big and heavy and awkward to transport another spare. And if I did, I have to carry less of something else, otherwise my vehicle will be over its payload. And I think it's okay to only have one spare for quite a few reasons. The first one is tire technology has come a very long way. These are E load rated tires, so they have a very strong sidewall. These things are really durable and tough. So the chances of actually destroying a tire are quite slim. The other thing is that I do have a plug kit. So if I've got a hole in the tread, I can plug that no problem at all. And I have a very high quality air compressor, so it's no problem for me to air up and air down as I need to. Another trick that really helps is that this vehicle has tire pressure monitoring or TPMS. And so what that means is the Jeep will alert me if any tire suddenly loses pressure. And even more than that, on the dash, I can see the individual pressure of every single tire at all times. So actually, while I'm driving along, I watch them when they start out at cold pressure. And then as I drive, they go up a couple of PSI. And then I keep an eye on them to make sure they never fluctuate unexpectedly. Are they getting too hot? or are they suddenly getting cold and losing all of their pressure? So what that means is even if I did damage a tire, I would know about it instantaneously. I could stop driving and I wouldn't be driving on a flat tire, which greatly reduces the chance that I will actually destroy it. All of that being said, there is always the possibility that I would slash a sidewall. And if I did that, yes, the tire would likely be destroyed and I can't repair it. And I would have to run my one spare tire. That is a risk that I am taking, and I think the chances of that are so low that I'm okay to accept that. So we just thought we'd take a minute and talk briefly about some of the food we're gonna be packing on this trip. So the Jeep is great. We have a huge amount of kitchen space and fridge space. So we normally actually carry quite a bit of food with us, but it still warrants a little bit of thought in terms of how we're gonna be packing for this trip because we're gonna be on a lot of really bumpy roads. And especially since we're gonna be isolated and away from everyone, we wanna make sure that our food's still in really good shape. So the first thing is that we packed a lot of really dense um, fruits and vegetables. So uh, we only packed apples, uh, with us pears can bruise really easily so we you know packed those on top of some tea and some softer things to keep them protected and then in terms of veggies we didn't bring anything like lettuce or spinach that would bruise easily we packed a squash or a pumpkin um, and also things like cucumbers uh, that are nice and solid and would hold up well in the fridge the second thing is we also packed a pretty good variety in terms of we've got really nice fresh stuff to last us the first seven or eight days and then on top of that we also brought we restocked our pantry so we've got lots of cans of beans and we also stocked back up on some of the dried food that we would bring with us backpacking it's really light it lasts a long time so even if we don't end up eating it on this trip we know we'll use it in the future and it doesn't add a lot of weight to our payload and the last thing is we tried to pack some 
uh, nice fun treats and a good variety of food. We love to eat and being in these super beautiful wild and remote places, you want to make sure that you've got a lot of things to choose from. You want to have some meals that are quick and easy to make if it's been a long day, but you also want to be able to enjoy yourself and cook a little bit more of an elaborate meal um, if you're somewhere really nice and you've got a bit more time to enjoy. The other thing we wanted to consider, and you might be wondering too, how long are they going out into the desert for? Are you really going to be out there for two whole weeks? That looks like tons of food. And the answer is, of course, no. We're really planning for seven to ten days of travel, but we always bring extra food with us when we're on the road. And we saw that even a couple weeks ago when we were in the Fink River Gorge in the West McDonald Ranges. It was beautiful and we stayed an extra four or five days longer than we planned. And we love that. We love having that option. So we wanted to have extra food with us in case we wanted to stay longer. Of course, extra food's always helpful if something happens and you get stuck, like we did when we were in Marie and it was rained out everywhere. And the last thing as well is when we get to Birdsville, we know there's gonna be a store, but we don't know what will be in the store. So it's great knowing that we've got a couple extra days on either side worth of food that we can be totally self-sufficient even if there isn't a store around. So I hope that video has been helpful and I hope it gets you thinking about doing a big crossing of your own. They are immensely rewarding and I cannot wait to get out and drive across at least a thousand of these sand dunes like the one behind me. So if it has been helpful, hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. The Simpson video is coming next week. I can't wait to see how beautiful it is and show you guys how all of my planning actually works out. And if you'd like to get more information, behind the scenes access, all my GPS track logs, all the campsites and the track log for the Madigan line on the Simpson, all of that is available to my supporters over on Patreon. So you can head over there and check it out, see what's available, learn more and gear up so you can do your own massive desert crossing. So thanks again for watching, have fun out there, and maybe I'll bump into you on the road.